Welcome to the Phoenix DMA YouTube channel. This video will cover the hardware setup, BIOS setup, firmware install, and also troubleshooting for our model U75 TDMA card. All of our DMA hardware can be purchased from either our website directly or on our Amazon store. At the time of this video, all of our products ship from within the beautiful United States of America. Maybe you've heard of it. Let's go over what will be included in the box for the DMA card. The DMA card itself will be tucked beautifully inside an anti-static bag. The mounting bracket, heat sink, and fan will all be pre-assembled to the DMA card's PCB. Below the DMA card, we have the Phoenix DMA Support Business Card. This card includes a written link to our Discord server, support email address, and our website support page. The other side of the business card contains a QR code that will take you to the online written and picture version of this video. Next, we have a USB flash drive, which contains another copy of the instructions, the JTAG drivers, the data driver, a firmware flash tool, and lastly, a firmware.bin file. Be sure to keep this puppy close. We will be using it later. Lastly, we have the 3.0 USB-C to USB cable. This is the cable that you will use to connect your second PC to your DMA card's data and JTAG ports. Let's go over some key physical features of the DMA card. As mentioned before, the silver heatsink with the fan have already been pre-installed onto the DMA card. The data port, JTAG port, and kill switch are all in line on the side of the DMA card. The JTAG port on most DMA cards is always the port that will be closest to the motherboard. The data port will be the port that is furthest from the motherboard. The kill switch is located in between the data and JTAG ports. Locking the button inwards will allow the card to have power, while locking it further out will disable the power to the DMA card. This is useful for when you don't need the DMA card, but you also don't want to fully remove it. To install the DMA card into your computer, you will need two tools. First, we have a magnificent Phillips head screwdriver. Second, you will need a screw to secure the PCI bracket to your computer's case. I'm a silly goober and I lost my original PCI slot covers. So I am using this image to show you where you can find this screw in your computer's case. For the main PC, we are using an absolutely gorgeous B450 AMD based system. Before installing the DMA card, please ensure the computer is not only powered off, but the power cable is also removed from the power supply. The DMA card can be installed into an X1 up to an X16 PCI slot. Here we have two X1 slots and a single X16 slot. For now, we will be installing the DMA card in the bottom X1 slot to ensure it is furthest away from the GPU. Placing the DMA card into the slot does not require a lot of force. If you find yourself needing to apply a lot of force to install the card, you can loosen the top screw and adjust the mounting bracket until it is in a position that allows for easy install. Please stand by while my Tesla robot assists me with screwing the bracket into the computer case. It is very important that you secure the mounting bracket to your computer case. We have seen many failures due to this being skipped. If the DMA card moves at all, when the PC is powered on, you will be putting the DMA card, your motherboard, or both at risk if the card is not secured properly. At this time, you can plug your power cable back into your computer's power supply, as well as switch the power supply back on. Now we will be making some beautiful adjustments in the BIOS of your main PC. This main PC is AMD based, so the BIOS settings in the video will be specific to AMD. However, we will show the settings for Intel as well. For this video, I will be using 200% of my brain power by utilizing the search bar function of my BIOS. If you do not have this function, you will need to consult the manual for your BIOS to find these settings. The first setting to change is IOMMU on an Intel system. This setting will be virtualization or VMX. This setting needs to be disabled. The next setting is SVM. On an Intel system, this setting will be VTD. This setting also needs to be disabled. Those are the only two BIOS changes needed for your DMA card to operate normally. There are other BIOS settings that can be changed for specific applications that will be covered in the troubleshooting portion. Ensure that you save your changes, then boot into Windows. After doing the required BIOS steps and booting your main PC, take a note of your LED behavior. By the data port, you should have one solid red LED and one green LED that will flash a few times on startup, then go solid after a few seconds. In the rear of the card, you should have one solid green LED. 
This is a sign of healthy operation. We are now in the second computer. The files we are going to use for this portion are included on the flash drive. These files can also be found in the instructions on our website. I will be applying some extra chromosomes and use the flash drive for this video. It is recommended to extract the files from the flash drive and keep the flash drive as a safe copy. We have covered steps one and two already in the video. For the Microsoft redistributables, you will need to extract this folder somewhere. Inside of the folder, there is a .bat file at the top. Run the .bat file, and this will install all of the redistributables in the folder for you. As a level 200 Sigma, I have already done this on my system, so there is no need for me to do it again. It should take no more than two minutes for all of the redistributables to install. Next, you need to ensure that your main PC is turned on and the second PC is plugged into your DMA JTAG port via the included USB cable. Extract the archive from the JTAG driver folder somewhere and then go into the folder after. Now, I will right-click the Windows icon to go into Device Manager and show you where the JTAG serial device can be found. When you open the Ports section of Device Manager, you will see the USB serial device with the assigned COM port. If you are using a DMA card besides our Model U, then your serial device might include the text CH347 in the device name, or it may show in other devices with an error. For the video, I am going to uninstall the JTAG device and then reinstall the driver using the setup files. Please wait a moment while my Tesla robot removes the JTAG cable and puts it back into my second computer. Run the setup file in the main folder and then click Install. Now open the Driver Setup 64 folder. Run the setup file and click Install again. This is all you need to do to install the JTAG drivers. You can now move on to the next steps. The data driver install is optional. In most cases, the data driver will install on its own automatically. I will demonstrate this after the firmware flash. Our DMA cards come pre-installed with PCI Leech-based firmware. This firmware is available on GitHub for free. Phoenix DMA does not sell or include any firmware that is designed to bypass anti-cheat systems. There are many GigaChat sellers that can provide you with this type of firmware if you need it. The firmware on the flash drive is also PCI Leech-based firmware. It is included so that we can teach you as the card owner how to flash your own DMA card. Start by extracting the CH347 tool folder to the root of your C drive. This is to create a short file path for the flash tool, which will allow a smoother operation. In the CH347 flash tool folder, run the download tool application. For the 75T card, you will select the 75T option in the top left box. In the middle box, you will select the bin option. For the example firmware, we have placed this file in a folder that is in the same folder as the flash tool. If you are using your own file, it would be best to put it in the flash tool folder as well. There cannot be any spaces in the firmware file path or file name. Click the button below the FPGA text to select your firmware file. Click the button to the left of the 0% bar to start the firmware flash. You will see that the tool will start flashing the firmware and go until sector 32 or 33. At this point, wait up to five minutes for the flash to complete. Once the flash is complete, you will have a message like shown. At this point, you can turn off your main PC, wait 10 beautiful seconds, then turn on your main PC again. We will be using the included loan DMA test tool to verify the DMA is operational. Extract the FPGA DMA test folder where your precious soul desires. Now move the USB cable from the JTAG port on the DMA card to the data port. Open Device Manager again and open the Universal Serial Bus Controller section. You will see that the FTDI USB bridge device is there. To demonstrate, I will uninstall this device with the driver to show that the data driver will usually install on its own automatically. If this is not the case or the device has an error, you can install the driver from folder number three. 
At this time, I am removing the precious data cable and putting it back into the second PC. The device will show back up with an error. At this time, the computer will install the driver in the background. Allow up to 60 seconds for this to happen. As you can see, some sorcery has occurred in the background, and the driver has installed on its own. Now we can move on to the DMA test. Inside the DMA test folder, run the Lone DMA test application. After the application loads, gently caress the number one on your keyboard. Read speeds of around 5,500 to 6,000 is normal for the Model U. Throughput speeds of 190 to 200 is normal as well. If you received an error, your throughput failed, or both your read and throughput failed, Please see the troubleshooting steps at the end of the video or contact us for support. The final thing you need to do on this beautiful journey is verify that the firmware can be seen on the main PC. On the main PC, open Device Manager and open the Other Devices section. You will see that the Ethernet controller device is in fact there. If you are running a Cool Guy 1 to 1000 emulated firmware, then you will need to check the respected section for whatever device type the firmware is supposed to be emulating to verify it is running correctly. This concludes the setup for the Phoenix DMA 75T card. For extra assistance, please view over the troubleshooting portion of the video that follows, or contact us directly for assistance. For the troubleshooting portion, we will mostly be covering common DMA speed test result errors and how to resolve them. These scenarios are put into the video in a specific order on purpose, and it is recommended to do the steps in every scenario, even if your issue is not the one actively presented. Before doing anything, go back to the firmware flashing part of the video and flash PCI leech base firmware to your DMA card. It is recommended to do any troubleshooting on base firmware. It is highly wise to ensure you have a .bin file copy of your cool guy firmware before reverting back to PCI leech base. If your GigaChad firmware seller did not give you this initially, then they probably will not on request, and any issue you have, they will be responsible for fixing. It is hard to determine if an error is caused by your 1 to 69 Gooner firmware or something else if you have not validated your DMA card on base firmware. The first common error is the VMM, and it failed with all zeros in the device error. This error is almost always due to your data connection not being seen by the test tool. To verify your data connection, right-click on the Windows icon and open Device Manager. To produce this error, I currently have my second PC plugged into my JTAG port on my DMA card. As you can see by the USB serial device under the port section. In some cases, you may have your second PC plugged into your data port, but you are not seeing the FTDI bridge device in the USB section. If this is the case, first make sure that your DMA card is not kill switched and the lights are on. Second, find another USB cable to use. Please give me a moment while I switch the USB cable to my DMA card's data port. As you can see, the FTD bridge device is now in my USB section in Device Manager. Now we can run another test and see if we are going. If you have done these steps, but you are still getting the error, follow the steps on the screen and try a speed test again after, if no worky. You can continue to rest of the guide as the other scenario fixes may help as well. The next scenario is the VMM, and an error but with non-zeros in the device error. This is commonly caused by misconfiguration of the BIOS on the main PC, or by Windows settings that can be conflicting on the main PC. Here we are back in this absolute beast of a machine, main PC BIOS. I have intentionally reverted the required virtualization-related settings to produce this error that I will now change back. Then we will cover some other settings that can be useful to change. The first additional setting will be NX mode. This is generally on AMD-based systems. This setting needs to be disabled. In some cases, NX mode will not show in search, but can still be found within the BIOS settings. In my case, the setting can be found manually in the advanced CPU configuration of the overclock settings. Please refer to your BIOS manual to ensure you do or do not have this setting. The next additional setting will be CSM mode or CSM support. This setting needs to be set to either enabled or CSM. The final setting will be fast boot and fast memory boot. 
This setting needs to be disabled. If you have both settings, then disable both of them. Here is an overview of all of the changes just made. Some of the settings here automatically change just from changing the CSM setting. Save these changes and then boot into Windows. On our main PC, we are going to verify that we do or do not have memory integrity. To do this, open the device security settings page. My system does not have the core isolation section, which is what memory integrity is in. Instead, I will show a picture of what this setting looks like. After checking this setting, you can reboot the main PC and then try another speed test once the main PC is turned back on. At this point, if you are still unable to run a speed test, you can reach out to us on Discord, regardless of what DMA card you have, and we will help you. The next scenario will be a low-performing speed test and tips on how to identify the root cause and correct the issue. With this speed test result, take note on how both the read speed and the throughput speed are underperforming. Most DMA cards, regardless of 35 or 75T, will perform in the 5,500 to 6,000 plus range for read speeds and 190 to 200 plus for read throughput. When both read and throughput are underperforming, this is almost always an issue with the cable being used from the second PC to the DMA. Instead of guessing and going through cables, hoping for the next one to work, I will show you how to verify this. The software we are going to use to verify the USB cable is called USB Device Tree Viewer. Go onto their website and download this software and extract it from the zip file to anywhere. Then run the software. Within USB Tree Viewer, find the FTDI device. Take note of the USB version, port max speed, device max speed, and device connection speed. I am using some random cable that I found on Air Force One, and it turns out that it is a USB 2.1 cable instead of a USB 3.0 cable. The FTDI interface on the DMA card is a 3.0 interface, so your cable type and USB port on the second PC need to be at least a 3.0 in order to have a healthy connection. Please stand by while I switch this trash AF cable for a 3.0 cable. As you can see, this new cable goes hard AF. The USB version is showing 3.1, and all of the speeds are showing super speed. At this point, my DMA speed should be hitting, so let's check. The DMA read and throughput are now reading at a passing rate on the 3.0 cable, as you can see. This next scenario I was not able to replicate on my system, so I am using a customer image instead. This issue is very common, especially on custom firmware applications. Like every other scenario, we are only covering what to do for base firmware issues. This issue is specific to having stable read speeds, but being locked to a 10 to 40 megabyte per second throughput speed. To troubleshoot this, you will need to do everything in the previous scenarios, as well as change a BIOS setting. In your main PC BIOS, search for the term PCI. For my system, the setting I need to change is the PCI Gen switch. The name of this setting may vary, and you may need to refer to your BIOS manual to find the correct setting. The most thorough method for troubleshooting this issue is to start with the Gen 1 option. Set the Gen switch to Gen 1. Save your BIOS and boot windows. Do a DMA speed test. If your results did not change, go back into your BIOS and go to the next Gen setting and so on until you have tried all. This concludes the setup and troubleshooting video for our 75T DMA card. If your issue was not solved here, please reach out to us on Discord. We do also provide support to non-customers, but please understand that customers will always have priority for support.